of you here this morning. Do be thinking about our young people as they are uh, away at camp this week. Uh, camp was uh, formative in the building up of my faith, as I know it was in many of yours. Uh, so pray that they'll have a great week, a safe week, and they'll come back uh, rejuvenated for Christ, or that perhaps some will commit their lives to Christ. We certainly always hope that. The phrase toxic masculinity has been thrown around a lot in modern America. This involves cultural pressures for men to behave in a certain way. And someone might label that toxic masculinity. That you're a man, you're supposed to do these two or three things. You're not supposed to cry, you're not supposed to help people. Well, when I'm helping people, I'll cry quite a bit. And so, ain't I a man? Toxic manhood prizes behaviors that could be considered bullying even, such as picking on the weak or bossing people around rather than leading them. Many use the phrase toxic masculinity to describe behaviors of men that they don't particularly like, but that are classically associated with men. Masculinity, however you define it, has been attacked by many groups, those who would ask men to temper who they are. Some of us are a lot to take on at once, I know, and perhaps we should learn humility. However, may we not temper what God has created us to be and to do. And if that offends people, then so be it. For men, we should want to have our fullest of potentials realized so that we can do what God has called us to do. We can all agree, I believe, that instead of looking at culture, we need to go back to the Bible for the understanding of what manhood really is. So today, we are beginning a lesson, a series of four lessons called The Mighty Men of David. Through biblical teaching, I hope that we will discover true biblical manhood. Today, David and his mighty men were going to talk specifically about the three. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 Samuel chapter 23. In, Sa in Samuel and throughout Chronicles, we read about these mighty men. And today, we're going to talk about three in particular. These mighty men are typically classified in groups anywhere from 30 to 35. These mighty men of David, you'll hear it, hear it called, hear it read, the 30, or the, the, or the, the three. And we're going to focus today specifically on a group of three, and they're often highlighted in Scripture. This elite force was close to David, and these might be considered much like our Navy SEALs or our Army Rangers. There's some pretty bad dudes right there. But this elite force was close to David and was known for helping him regain the throne. And the Bible gives us a few details on at least two of these particular groups of three. Today we're going to talk about one in particular. Now men and women, we are not soldiers, at least here, fighting actual physical battles. We are Christian soldiers. But the qualities of these men are no less required of each of us to fight the battles that we face. So let's look today and in the coming weeks, but let's look today at these particular three men and see what they had in their lives, what characteristics they had that helped them rise to the challenge. 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 8 says this, Josheb Bashabeth, a Tekinamanite, chief of the captains. He was called Adino the Esnite because of 800 slain by him at once. So Josheb, he was known for his prowess, for his dedication, for his ability to fight in battle. David, you see, was nothing without his mighty men. He needed them. He had God, but if he was to lead God's people, if he was to regain his throne, if he was to be who God called him to be, he needed his mighty men to be with him, and his mighty men needed him as well. Throughout our culture, throughout our homes, throughout our congregations, 
we look to people to lead in one way or another. And these men that we read of in 1 Samuel chapter 22, we learn that they did not exactly start out as mighty men. In 1 Samuel chapter 22, David had been pushed away from Saul and from his kingdom. And in 1 Samuel chapter 22 it reads, David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. David had been pushed away. He'd been, he'd been you know, cast out. And so what, what's David going to do now? Where well, there were people who wanted to know who David was and where he was, and they wanted to follow him. Verse 2. Everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him, and he became captain over them. Now there were about 400 men with him. So those men who went to him, Joseph most likely included in this group, these were men that were discontented. These were men who were in distress. These were men who were in debt. These were men who were hungry. And they wanted a change. For whatever reason put them in these various distressing situations, they wanted a change and they said, let's go find David. He's an outcast like us now, but I know that he can help us survive. I know that he can even perhaps help us flourish. And from this group, this is where the groups of 30 come from. This is where the elite, more elite groups of three come from. One of which we're reading about this morning. We don't need men or women who are perfect. But we do need men who are dedicated. Whenever someone has become a success in their life, if you look deep enough into their history, you'll see they've not been perfect. You'll see that they've gone through struggles. You'll see that they've had to fight battles that perhaps no one else has ever had to fight. And it was through that struggle that they gained the strength that they needed to be who they are today. If someone is a success today in whatever way you might turn that, you you might look at them and and they're not going to be able to tell you an easygoing kind of life. They're going to tell you stories of heartache and heartbreak and how they've failed miserably. Sometimes, men and women, we think we have to be perfect whenever we come in here, and we don't. Whenever you know you're not perfect, guess what that does? That helps you to see that you need a Savior. That helps you to see that you need change in your life, that you need to be dedicated to personal growth. Now David, he needed fighters, and Joseph was known for killing 800 800 men slain by him at one time. That takes dedication. And that takes personal growth for someone to be that dedicated to do something that he is called to do. In his book, One Crowded Hour, Tim Bowden describes an incident in Borneo in 1964 the Nepalese fighters known as Gurkhas were asked if they would be willing to jump from airplanes into combat against the Indonesians. The Gurkhas didn't clearly understand what was involved, but they bravely said they would do it. Dedication. If you're asked to do something, are you going to be dedicated enough to do it before you even know what it's all about? You see, the Gurkhas, here they were. They bravely said they would do it, asking only that the plane fly slowly over a swampy area and no higher than 100 feet. They were then told, well, the parachutes won't open at 100 feet. Parachutes? What's that? They didn't understand that they would be jumping with parachutes. They were ready to risk their lives to jump from an airplane, to do what they had to do to help free those who were being downtrodden and oppressed. They were that dedicated. 
We need men and women in the Lord's church who are dedicated and who are willing to rise to the challenge. Next, we read of Eleazar in 2 Samuel chapter 23. Our next verse, verse 9. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three, three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there to battle. And the men of Israel had withdrawn. So we know, we know of Joshua and his dedication. Now we're reading of Eleazar. One of these three, one of these mighty men who was with David when they defied the Philistines. And this is most likely the same location, at least nearby where David had killed Goliath. But Eleazar was there, and they, the Philistines, they were gathered there to battle, and the men of Israel, they had withdrawn. Eleazar was there, David was there, it's another battle. The other Israelites, they've left, they've gone. He arose and struck the Philistines until his hand was weary and clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to strip the slain. War is a horrible thing. I'm fortunate enough not to have ever been in war. Many of you can say the same, but we're all knowledgeable and, and have enough respect for those who have gone into war to know it's not easy, to say the very least. We respect those who have chosen to do that and to defend our country. But it is those who have been in battle, and I think all of us, though, can appreciate Eleazar who is standing there not willing, you see, to drop his sword. Not willing to take his sword down, but willing to stand there and fight. Everybody else is left. They're gone. You know, when you've got a large number against a small number, you know, I would imagine you'd feel pretty good about your odds. And you're, you're standing there, you've got your sword ready, and you turn around, let's get, where'd they go? <laughs> and he's all by himself now. And what does he do? He doesn't back down. Why? Because he is loyal to the cause. He is loyal to what he has been asked to do. And this is another characteristic, men, that we need. We need to be dedicated to what we have been called to do. We need to be loyal to those who depend upon us. David was a great leader, and here Eleazar says, David, I know you slew Goliath with just those stones and with God. Now I'm here with you to battle these Philistines by ourselves, and I'm not going to drop my sword until the battle is done. This is a tremendous example for believers today. Can you stand alone? When you feel alone, can you remember your faith and dedication to Jesus Christ in order to stand alone against those that might try to battle against you with whatever that might look like. To stand alone, you must know the Scripture. I'm sure that Eleazar was an accomplished swordsman. Otherwise, he would not have been able to overtake those who came to battle with him, those Philistines. We must know our sword. We must know our Scripture if we are to stand alone many times, and fight against those who would come against us. To stand alone, you must be a part of Christ's body. There are many here who have not given their lives to God, who have not confessed the name of Christ, who have not said, I am going to follow Christ and Christ alone, and then are baptized into a watery grave and come up a new person. Whenever you are unable to stand alone, have you put on Christ? Ask yourself that. Are you a Christian? Do you know your word? Can you stand alone because you have a faith that can move mountains? It's what else we need. Because if we are to stand alone and, and be that, that loyal fighter, when all else has left, we've got to have the tools to be able to stand there. Eleazar, he had his tool. He knew what he was doing with it, and he gripped that so hard. I, I wonder sometimes if they had to come and pry his fingers off of the sword because he had, 
had held on to it for so long and for so diligently that even whenever he told his hand to let go, he couldn't because he was so loyal to what he had given his life to. The good times are good, thankfully, but we need men and women who will show up and are loyal to Christ in the good times and in the bad. We've seen a lot of varying times here at the congregation, but we have stood firm in the faith. We've stood firm, I believe, with one another. But that's the other thing. We must be loyal to Christ, but we must be loyal to each other because this is how we can get through difficult times. Our society has changed in the last 50 years drastically in the last 20 or 30. And there are many men today who feel alone. Not because they don't have friends or family, but perhaps because they don't have one or two other men to speak with. Because they don't have one or two other men that they admire, that helps them sharpen their sword, that challenges them to be a better man that helps them to rise up and face the challenge and be who God has called him to be. We've got to be loyal to one another. And if you don't have a man friend like that, try to foster that or try to be that friend for somebody else that you know and you see them as being alone. Reach out to them because it only takes one or two for a man to be a better man. Because a man who's really your friend, who cares for you and who is is loyal to you as that friend, will push you along. He won't tell you what you want to hear. I call Matthew Moran as as nice as he is to me when he was here. He tells me what I need to hear. If he says if I'm being foolish, he's going to tell me that. If I'm saying something silly or or acting a certain way that's foolish, he's going to let me know that. You've got to have a man in your life that's going to do the same thing. Or perhaps a good wife, because she can certainly make us all better. Amen? But a good man friend is also an excellent thing to have. Because it's how we'll get through difficulties. Loyalty is something that we all need. 2 Samuel chapter 23, in verse 11. Now after him was Shema, the son of Aji, a Herorite, And the Philistines were gathered into a troop where there was a lot of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. Now, a lentil is a small round bean. And it's good. You make it, put it in the right soup, it's very good. Well, in these days, that was their food source. Okay, what do we do? We run to Kroger and hope all the beans aren't taken out. So we defend... A lot of times our food source, we try to go and, and, to, and to grab and make sure that we have enough. Well, in these days, they had to defend a lot of enemies against burning their fields. Because if they didn't have the lentils, which they would store and eat throughout the year, if they didn't have those lentils, guess what? They didn't eat. They couldn't go to a store. It's how, it's how a lot of battles would be won, is that you're... Uh, enemy, he would come in and, and destroy your food source. And when you can't eat, you've got to do something. So you might you know, go on into slavery or, or something like that because you've got to eat, otherwise you'll just die. Well, here we read of Shema. Shema is in a field. There was a lot of lentils there. And he knew the price that would be paid if he did not defend that field. He took his stand in the midst of the, pl- of the plot defended it, and struck the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. This took courage. And this, you see, is where the rubber meets the road. Maybe Shema was tired of running. Maybe he was tired of giving up ground, and whatever the reason, he stopped, drew his sword, and said, enough is enough people that were encroaching upon his people, perhaps they had destroyed other fields. Shema had had enough and he said, I'm going to stand in this field and I'm going to defend it. And it's at that point that he said, whatever happens, I'm going to defend my field and I'm not going to let anybody take it over. 
The question is, what is your field? What are you tired of running from? It takes courage to face our demons. It takes courage to face those things that are killing our family. Our own individual family, you see. Because if you want to be dedicated, if you want to be loyal, if you want to have courage, your first and biggest priority of a field should be your family. Where you're saying enough is enough, or I'm not going to let these things into my house, I'm going to keep them away from my children because I want them to grow up in a faith that's going to bring them to Christ and take them to heaven someday. We must take our place and we must make a stand and believe in something. Believe in what we're fighting for. Believe that anything that's trying to encroach on that or minimize that is wrong. I'm all for hearing what what people believe and, and how they think, but at some point, Christian, we've got to say, I don't want this in my house. I don't want this in my life. I want to get it out of here. Because when you let little things in, those seeds take hold, they take root in your heart and in your children's heart, and they grow and they they push them away from Christ. They push them away from your spouse. They push you away from God because you didn't have the courage to stand firm and say, I'm not going to let this evil into my house. That takes courage to stand up against that. So pick your field. Pick your field and fight it every single day. You know, people will come to counseling and they'll ask questions and we'll be together for months or for years because a lot of things take a long time to fight. I don't think that Seamus' fight was a short one. It probably took him a long time to fight off those Philistines, not just a, a quick battle. So we must be ready to fight for the long haul and not just the short term. Because especially in in raising our children and trying to make our marriages better, that takes work. That takes time. But remember that you can look to God to give you the strength to fight on. Because we must possess the courage to continue. Even when others have quit. Even when others have gone away and run off. You've got to have that courage to be able to stand firm. And hopefully you do. Hopefully you do because you are able to say... I believe in God. I am a Christian. I know His Word. And I'm going to fight for where I stand and what I believe in. So fight for the field. That field might look different for all of us. It might be a moral fight or a relationship or a a personal problem. But fight for what is important. Fight because you are tired of backing down. This morning we have spoken about dedication, about loyalty and about courage. Men, I want you to have that. I want you to have those three things in your life. And over the coming weeks, we're going to talk more about David and his mighty men. Be dedicated to a cause. Be loyal to those who who depend on you. And have courage. Have courage to stand up to the devil and to the way that he tries to destroy your family. Because it's small. It's minuscule because that's how He gets in. That's how He gets in and takes over your life. Don't let that happen. It is said twice in 2 Samuel chapter 23 that the Lord brought about a great victory that day. Indeed, He did. Because these are amazing accounts that we read of. Do you need a great victory in your life? I hope you do. And I hope if you need to respond this morning, you'll make that great victory happen. If you need to become a Christian, if you need prayers for forgiveness, come forward this morning and let us help you and assist you in anything you might have need of. Won't you come now as we stand and sing to encourage you?